नमो तस भगवत अर्हतो सम्मुत नमो तस भगवत अर्हतो सम्मुत नमो तस भगवत अर्हतो सम्मुत स अपारुथा संग मथ सौरा सौरवंथा मुंजंतु सथंग So this afternoon we reflect on the subject that I've been given to discuss is consciousness and mindfulness. And that's all I ever talk about anyway. So this is a particular subject of interest in in the worldly life here in Britain, in America and other countries, particularly mindfulness, consciousness. And in uh, the Buddhist teaching, this is well explained in these very old Pali teachings that we've inherited through this tradition. <clears throat> And so we, we're living at a time where the modern civilization is, is has so much information available on the internet and worldwide. And as the planet tends to shrink in size, people travel from one country to another with great ease. This wasn't so, say, 50, 60 years ago. So information, is so much information available. Some of it very good, some of it useless. Some of it is called misinformation, deliberate attempts to delude us. The basic delusion has already been established in this sense of uh, emphasizing that we have an individual self and uh, in my background, speaking from experience, this was very much emphasized the importance of oneself as a separate individual entity in the universe. And when I uh, met Lumpur Cha, I used to meditate a lot on the, on the sky and uh, just because in the forest at Watpapong, the, you know, you're surrounded by trees and vines and everything is, is uh, rather abundant in nature. And then the sky is empty. And I used to feel that that when we talk, where is the center of the universe? You know, just a kind of a questioning yourself, just for fun. Does the universe that we believe in is the universe that we've been told and educated with these very materialistic viewpoints about how the universe or the religious ones about it was created by a deity but in terms of actual experience, for each one of us, whether you realize it or not, whether you've ever contemplated like this in your own life, <clears throat> is to see that, that each one of us is the center. You know, if you're looking for a center, don't look any further than here and now. Because in practical terms, is, is there a center to the universe? You'll never find it. 
because it, you know, the consciousness space have no dimensions. They have no beginning, middle or end. And so this brings us down to the, to the Four Noble Truths, which is based on the common human experience of suffering. So it grounds us to look at something, you know, trying to figure out who created the universe, where is the center, these are all, you know, kind of reflections, because we see the universe in terms of conditioning, mental, emotional conditioning. We've acquired through modern science, psychology, religion. But then, and I encourage, you know, all of you to realize that in the reality, the experience of life, you're the very center of the experience of the universe. Each individual Because you're experiencing the universe through this point here and now. So that's why meditation is, uh, you know, when we talk about insight into Dhamma, it's budgetang way tidapo, we need to be realized individually. That's that's the point that. No one else can realize for you. You know, no matter how enlightened the teacher might be, or the Buddha, the historical Buddha himself, could not enlighten his disciples by telling them, telling them about the Dhamma, but in pointing to Dhamma, so in Theravada Buddhism, we have this word Dhamma, which is where we start. You know, we take, we, even before we know anything about Buddhism, we hear Buddha's Dhamma, Dhamma, Buddha Dhamma. And the word Dhamma is used in Sanskrit, but this Dhamma has many connotations in, in Western civilization. But in terms of the reality of being the center of the universe here and now, where is the Dhamma? You know, there's a question to ask yourself, because I'm encouraging you to question. It's like investigating, you don't just quote scriptures and wise sayings from the Tripitika or from anyone else. But it's like this invitation, Dhamma Vichaya, to investigate with sati, with mindfulness, the way things are. So this is a gift that we inherit in this tradition, this opportunity to investigate our own experience the way we are, you know, your own particular personality habit patterns, your, your particular cultural conditioning, is not to be, we don't, we can't operate from that, from cultural conditioning or from perceptions that are, that are, that we hold on to, we cling to. So you can't you can't define dhamma as a as a quality as a condition you can't describe it but it's apparent here and now and so then you 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 begin to to awaken to the here and now the here and now you, you know you're aware you're mindful when you really think about, are you conscious? You know, everybody's going to say they are. And that's apparent here and now for all of us. You know, it's not cultural, it's not scientific. It's just natural, 
what's natural before culture starts influencing us or religious uh, teachings start influencing us or social identities. So this is where this trusting this awareness, sati in the seven factors of enlightenment is the first factor. So it is foremost. Sati and then consciousness Sati is more like function of consciousness, functional. Dhamma, if there was no Dhamma, if there was no ultimate reality, there'd be no consciousness, space. And if there was no space, there'd be no forms. So this is just the logic and reason from this, this way of reflecting. When you start out with Dhamma as a kind of primordial reality before anything else can happen, we use this word Dhamma or the absolute or ultimate reality. These are English uh, ref uh, translations. But we don't need to define Dhamma so, because you can't, you know, there are, in terms of Pali Buddhist tradition, they, there are the Dhammas, the, the conditions that are manifest, that arise and cease, they're born and die in, in consciousness. And with Sati, as you observe, here and now, the way, the, what you're feeling, you're the puto, the knowing, the witness to the arising and ceasing of conditioned phenomena. This you can prove to yourself. This is budgetang meti da poenu. You can give the ex excellent directions like we have in Pali Buddhism. But it's like a road map. It's, it's not the reality itself. You have to take the journey. And then the journey is always here and now. It's not, you're not going anywhere, but changing from the habitual patterns of self-view, of sakaditi, of the ego, the, the habitual emotional habits that you've developed over the years in your life. These forms that we identify with are sensitive forms. They're sensory. There's a sensory rea reality that we're experiencing is like this. It's about feeling. Consciousness doesn't feel doesn't, space doesn't feel. But when you get to the four elements, earth, fire, water, and air, these are like fire and water, earth, okay. and manifesting in consciousness. They are the dhammas, the things that change, the rise and cease, the sankharas, the phenomena, that we are encouraged to witness to through observing just the, the simple experience of ordinary life. This is what happens like this morning what, when uh, we assembled for the traditional fortnightly recitation of the 227 rules. And you ask yourself, what is that now? It's a memory, isn't it? And, that, and today, this morning, is a memory. And so you, you have a, a category for reflection. A memory is something 
you know, that arises and ceases in consciousness. They have no kind of sustaining power, you know, they kind of float off and, and, and you kind of uh, gather them together when you need them. But the arising and ceasing of phenomena is happening all the time through thinking, through feeling, through seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. And this, all these complicated sensory conditions, emotional conditions, thoughts and, and uh, modern education, internet, modern science, psychology, all of it is phenomena, information arising and ceasing in consciousness. So there's too much to figure, try to figure everything out on that level. So there's many different languages. For a tree, there's so many different words in different languages for just naming a tree, using the word tree. And in its ultimate reality right now, that's an, a word that arises and ceases in consciousness. So even just thinking the word tree, where did it go? You know, this is a question to ask yourself, where did, I can, I can immediately repeat tree, over and over again, but it's but it, uh, words arise and cease very quickly, and yet so many emotional problems, personal problems, as we create them around from our arise from this thinking because of memories that we hold mistakes we've made in the past, or think we've made mistakes in the past, or resentments that we carry into the present from remembering events, unfair events uh, in, our, in the past. But then in terms of reflection and in investigation, Dhamma Vijaya, what is the past right now? If that's all there is, is here and now. What, what is the relationship of the past to the present? It's, it's a memory in that category of sanya kanda. So you begin to see the, the way things are, is not the way you think they are or believe they are, but they're like this. All that arises ceases. So this is sati, dhamma vijaya. Viri, piti, sukha, piti, pasadi, samadhi, upeka, stillness, silence. It leads to silence, factors of enlightenment. So consciousness is, is like this. You know it, because you are. These are, you know, this, this is not kind of cultural. Consciousness isn't about individual cultures, about Asian culture or European culture. Consciousness is the same, whether you're from Asia or Europe, Africa or wherever. Animals are conscious forms in the universe. And is consciousness something that is limited to the forms? Is there tree consciousness or 
rock consciousness or dog consciousness. In human consciousness, you know, the, is consciousness uh, is, is consciousness in the form or the form in consciousness? Well, to see the forms arising and ceasing in consciousness is just this sati sampachanya mindfulness. And this kind of open awareness, intuitive awareness, I use the word in, intuition or intuitive awareness. Because it's not defining or f concentrating on, on an object. Because objects are all sankharas, so if you concentrate on them, you know, then you have to sustain them through, through effort, through concentration practices on objects, samatha practices, you have to sustain concentration through effort. But sampatanya is, in, intuition, it's not, doesn't take effort. Intellectual definitions, defining, analyzing, criticizing phenomena takes effort. So we put a lot of effort into acquiring degrees from schools, universities. <clears throat> There's so much information now so readily available. That takes an effort to, to learn through concentrating on objects, but sampachanya is intuitive, which is where dhamma vijaya can, can operate. It's not to define, to criticize or analyze phenomena, but to see the nature of phenomena, to be the knowing of phenomena is something that arises and ceases. And what can phenomena arise and cease in? Is consciousness. So when, when you begin to, rather than trying to figure out what I'm trying to say, and if you are bewildered by this kind of reflection, that's another mental state to observe, to have this sampachanya intuitive awareness that being bewildered, trying to figure out, getting confused is like this. So wanting precise explanations for Buddha's teaching, there are so many, uh, websites available now to explain every form of Buddhism. You can, you know, available on internet. Mahayana, Tibetan Buddhism, Theravada Buddhism, Zen Buddhism, there's, there's so much available information. But if you acquire all that kind of knowledge, you know everything about Tibetan Buddhism, Theravada Buddhism, and so forth. All you've acquired is a lot of sanya, memories, a collection of sankharas, through clever intellectual analysis can be interesting, but it's not liberating. So sati sampatanya, this word intuition, it's embracing the moment, not defining it. So it's, it's this kind of open, unknowing, unknowingness that I encourage not to 
just watch, be the observer of your own habit tendency to want to define, get verification, find out what so-and-so thinks about, what's the proper definition for Sampachanya, what's the proper de definition for Vinyana. And so we can endlessly research the scriptures and come up with some maybe brilliant interpretations or foolish ones, but brilliant or foolish, they still everything ends up as as uh, conditioned phenomena rising and ceasing. So I like to refer to like intuition is more like an open receptivity to the present here and now. And that's why this phrase is like this. In Thai, the Chan Jao Kun Pudetat, great scholar and, and uh, enlightened Buddhist in Thailand, who passed away many years ago, would call, call it uh, Benyang Niang, which is a very simple Thai way of expression. Like it's like this in English. It's kind of primary school English lesson. So it's not interesting in itself. It's not an interesting interpretation of Dhamma or consciousness. But it is a reminder, it is words that help us to trust in awareness. Because if you, you know, if you, whatever you believe you are, if you think you're, you're not mindful enough, or you can't meditate, or you're bored, you doubt the efficacy of this life. These are all mental states to observe. And so Sampachanya is receive, receptive to that. It's not about telling you, you should have trust in Buddha Dhamma. Because you, we don't know what that is. We have maybe certain interpretations of that that we've acquired from traditions or from scriptures. But the real practice is investigating. And as you investigate, listening, it's like listening, like the, the, when you open yourself to just listening to the, to the sounds of nature. You're not focusing on just a bird's, particular bird's song, a particular sound, but you kind of open to it. And then you might question, so how do you do that? How do you open up to and listen to the natural sounds of this particular scene. So then you're thinking again. But you're aware of thinking, you're mindful of that you're thinking, you're, you're caught in doubts or worries, obsessive, can, uh, emotional habits that one can acquire. One comes across this all the time with people who have been so obsessed with their own fears, obsessed with their own sense of, of self-aversion. So they, they endlessly make a hell realm for themselves out of their thoughts. Is it, where is hell right now? Where is heaven right now? 
do you believe in hell and he heaven and hell or you don't believe in that or but you're aware whether you believe there is a hell that you'll go to if you're bad if you commit crimes break the precepts you'll go to hell but in the reality of this moment when you listen those are just words that you've you know you've acquired these words you're not born with a perception of hell so hell is is what we create you know endless self-criticisms worries about the future regrets guilt remorse about the past there's enough there in anyone's life to to create a, a, a doubt a worry an anxiety or a miserable hell realm of fear paranoia mistrust and that's rampant now in in modern life you know in political terms in so many countries there's this this endless fear generated you know suspicion fake news doubts deliberately created to delude us to create a kind of hatred and aversion see the the enemy is something to annihilate something to transform something to change so we wonder why i remember after the second world war when they created the united nations in san francisco i think this is 1947 i believe you know we all had hopes that they'd have an international organization of unity unifying all nations so that's a very brilliant idea you know one would hope by 2021 here and now that it would have been more effective just like all the endless traumas and wars in Afghanistan or the Middle East. Endless conflicts and political parties, divisiveness, blaming, accusing, all this comes from believing our thoughts, never, never taking, never having such an opportunity to investigate the nature of thinking. We get caught up with with uh, personal attitudes, perceptions, biases, prejudices that are all acquired. They're not natural phenomena. So the forms are in consciousness so this we share consciousness is unitive it's united nations united individuals nature itself dhamma so we start with dhamma nature absolute reality So we use this word Dhamma for, for that kind of helping us to, to open to the reality of here and now. If it's just up to me personally or you personally, like seeing oneself as a person, as the center of the universe is rather scary because the personality is very vulnerable and fragile and changeable 
So, you know, when, if, when I would interpret I am the center of the universe as a kind of investigatory reflection, as a, as a human form, as a fragile human form in nature, as the center of the universe, it's, it's t absolutely terrifying. Because what we see, hear, smell, taste, touch, think is so uncertain, changeable. And one feels so helpless as a, as a human form, as a separate human individual form in a vast universe. So if the ego, that I'm, I'm the center of the universe, that would be kind of narcissistic egotism, a kind of form of madness. So just seeing yourself always as a fragile form in a vast universe, you know, it's too scary to think about. You hear of climate change and and everything's changing beyond the control of, of me or of you. How can we stop climate change? The COVID pandemic, how can we stop and get rid of these terrible viruses? We want to, to get back to where we didn't have such images in our consciousness, such as the COVID pandemic or climate change. You know, these are ominous perceptions that none of us have any power to control as separate forms in the universe. So instead, we, we distract ourselves looking at TV or eating food or drinking liquor, taking drugs, just endless socializing, traveling, sexual behavior, all ways to, to kind of distract ourselves from the fear of being a lone, separate, fragile entity in a vast universe that's is overwhelming in its details and qualities and conditions. So when they say trust the awareness, a refuge in Buddha Dhamma Sangha, these are words in the, in like any other words, But they are reminders, just like the, the form, the 20, 227 rules of Padimogha every fortnight reciting these, these rules in Pali language. It's a form, a tradition, in which we reaffirm the form on a conscious intellectual level So the form itself is based on nonviolence, on peace. And like any form, it has its problems. And maybe it's not what people consider an ideal form. The ideal forms for modern life that I was raised with is freedom, personal freedom, equality. Democracy is a form. But it's not a form such as a deliberate form. It's more of a vague intellectual form of where everything is right, where the evil forces have been annihilated. But then that's the image of heaven. Heaven is where everything is right and beautiful and good, and everyone's trustworthy. So heaven is, right now, is, a, is an ideal we can imagine, taking imagination to its superlative best, 
is heaven. Hell is taking your imagery, the worst, most horrifying, terrifying images, perceptions of pain and misery, suffering is hell. But is there such a place as hell in the universe? Where is it, you know? And then, you know, is it, it, when you die, you know, a very dualistic way of thinking, you go to either heaven or hell. But where is heaven? Where is hell at this moment? Don't know. It's like this, not knowing. And by opening up to not knowing, to unknowingness, you begin to change the perceptual conditioning that you acquired into insight knowledge. Insight knowledge is is gut knowledge, something you know, not just because you you've you've read it in a book or been told by a famous teacher. It's not conditioning, but it's understanding the nature of phenomena is like this. Whether the phenomena is good, bad, universal, minute, whether it's an atom, whether it's a universe, all these are perceptions of of small and great. But at this moment in, at this time, here and now, it's like this. At this it's like this and this, and you can't describe it. You can be aware if you're, if you're caught in your intellect, your thinking, your doubting, your agreeing or disagreeing, your interest or boredom is like this. So consciousness Dhamma is the priority, comes first. Without Dhamma, consciousness in Dhamma, in awareness, we're getting beyond definition and, def and uh, de uh, description. These are just words taking all, what is the absolute? You know, that's a word people use all the time. And people say, uh, if I ask somebody, do you agree with me? And they say, absolutely. So it's a common enough English word, but in terms of religious terminology, the absolute reality, They're just words, so it's not like they are. They they disappear. They arise and cease in consciousness, just like this. The word absolute, or the word dhamma. You know, you deliberately think it, and it comes, it arises, and it disappears. Words cease very quickly. That's so, so interesting about them is they. To sustain thinking, you have to be caught in your mental proliferation habits. Thinking, you know, has, depends on grammar, on connecting to other words, criticizing, blaming, praising, believing, is all based on words, <laughs> concepts, images,
So space, consciousness, are they immeasurable? Earth, fire, water, and air, are they measurable forms that arise and cease in consciousness? The forms that we identify with, these human bodies, were born in consciousness and will and then sustain their lives, live through their lifespan, and then they die, they go disappear into consciousness. What's left when somebody dies? Are they still conscious? Is consciousness, does it die when somebody dies? And so when somebody dies, when their, it means their eyes no longer function, their ears, nose, tongue, they can't think, they can't see, hear, smell, taste, touch. They don't feel anything. Corpse is, doesn't have, its sensitive, its, its senses have died. They deteriorate. Vision deteriorates, hearing deteriorates, and so forth, even before you die. So consciousness is dependent upon the senses, or the senses dependent upon consciousness. But senses are phenomena, you know, conditions, earth, fire, water, and air, And so they're changing all the time. So can you get rid of change? Can you live your life trying to change everything for the better? You know, what, you know, in terms of personal abilities, you know, people want to do something about climate change, about injustice, unfairness, corruption, human rights. All these are, you know, things that need to be changed for the better. But as much as we try to change things, change just happens. It's the way things are. Condition phenomena is like this. So you're grounding yourself with wisdom. Wisdom is knowing the way it is, not having wise views or perceptions about life and the meaning of life in the universe, about heaven or hell. So is, I went to a funeral when Doreen Rowling, who's a good friend and very interested in meditation, passed away. And it was a Christian funeral. That was very nice, very pleasant in Salisbury. When we talk about what happens after death, you know, what happens when somebody dies? And then various people say, well, I feel her presence here. And so, you know, that's a feeling, isn't it? Not everybody has that feeling. Is there something left over when the body dies, a spirit, a soul, a, an energy? You know, who's to know till you die? But these are memories too, when we think of Doreen right now, it's a memory. 
And the memory, when she was alive, is Doreen is alive. And now the memory comes up that she's dead. The body is dead. But what doesn't die? Ask yourself. Is Doreen's soul a personal soul that survives the death of the body is up for speculation. We can deny it, say there's nothing left, or we can say, well, there's an energy remaining, and so what it doesn't, this is not important to hold on to these perceptions, but to see perceptions as conditioned phenomena, impermanent, and not self. So when we talk about deathless reality, deathless Dhamma, Amatta Dhamma, that can't be consciousness through the senses, or consciousness that is limited to the individual form sitting here in this temple, So ask yourself, is my body in consciousness or is consciousness just limited to this form, Ajahn Sumato, which makes me very separate, isolated form in the vast universe? That's where we get depressed and sad when somebody dies. When you get old, you know, you, you're getting close to the death moment. It's an experience every human being has to go through. So in reflection, you know, the more you see your body is, these forms are in space, space is in consciousness. Suddenly, it all begins to make sense. The Matta Dhamma, deathless reality. Suddenly, Dhamma is not something born and dies. And consciousness is spontaneous in Dhamma, in reality. We don't create it with images or memories or views or opinions or perceptions. So when you really want to know who you really are, don't settle for some petty-minded view about yourself. What you think you are, or believe you've been told you are, what you've been conditioned to believe you are, is all phenomena that arises and ceases in consciousness. So we take our stand with sati, sampajanya, then to trust that, that is the real refuge, that is Buddha Dhamma Sangha in the reality of that, those images. So now I'll end the Desana on this note, and uh, I believe there are questions. The first question is about mental proliferation, papancha. How does one reduce it? Does one need to bring it down to complete stillness, or does it sometimes have any use? Well, as I've already reflected that, that papancha 
the Pali word for conceptual proliferation is, is this a thinking habit. And that's where, uh, not trying to get rid of it, like trying to slow it down and annihilate Papancha, you know, then we, we're taking a stand against it. You know, we're trying to suppress it or, or demolish it, destroy it. They can't do that. But you can observe it. You know, this, this takes patient endurance, willingness to, to, to be the puto, the knowing, the witness of papancha, of conceptual proliferation habits. It's thinking, because thinking is like this, it goes on and on and on and bring up doubts and worries and form opinions and views and you operate from certain positions, designated positions of right and wrong, good and bad. So notice that right and wrong, right is something that we, we attach to very much and we can be very righteous. The truth, what's right, what's true, what's wrong, and what's false is bad. Now, good and bad are judgments, value judgments. But this reflective ability is, is observing, thinking is like this. You know, so it's not about trying to get rid of it. And if there is a desire to stop proliferating, stop being obsessed with thoughts, you can be aware of that. The desire to destroy conceptual proliferating is like this. Not wanting it, not wanting something is like this. And so desire itself in the second noble truth is, you know, I found that very helpful, the attachment to desire, desire to get rid of things, to get rid of defilements, to get rid of anger, to get rid of fear, jealousy, get rid of all these things we don't like about what we think we are to get rid of our habitual obsessive thought habits is a form of desire, vipuddhana in Pali. Now you can be aware of that. So it's, it's the sense of kind of attentiveness, relaxed, attentiveness and listening in this wide, wide open, unknowing reality of here and now, rather than trying to become an enlightened person by getting rid of papancha or conceptual proliferation habits, you know, that's still the, the sense of I am this person, this particular personality, this form that's got these bad habits I want to get rid of, is, is all about imagination. You imagine that. And when we grasp these images that we create out of ignorance, then we suffer. So life is <clears throat> about suffering. All that is mine, beloved, and pleasing will become otherwise, will become separated from me. The Samana Sanya reflections. All that is mine, beloved, and pleasing will become otherwise, will become separated from me. And this is, this is, you know, in terms of personal, conditioning, sense of me as a separate person, 
all that is mine, beloved and pleasing, will be beloved and pleasing forever, is a vain wish, isn't it? And we know that that's impossible, but that's what we, we, we're operating from in daily life. All that is mine, beloved and pleasing, will stay that way forever, is like this. And wanting to not separate from what is mine, beloved and pleasing, is like this. So this trust, this awareness, is willing to accept whatever it is like this. Non-judgmental, non-critical, doesn't define, but just observes, witnessing the, ar the arising, the manifesting of a condition, how long it lasts and its cessation. So in answer to that question, don't try to get rid of it. If you've got a proliferating habit of obsessive thinking, that's what you're going to learn from by understanding it, not by trying to change it or get rid of it and live in a world where there's no thoughts at all. By this, this way of reflecting, you begin to let go of these attachments that we have to the conditioned process that we've experienced in our lives. Just by seeing through them, not by getting rid of them. And what's left when you've let go of everything is silence. And the, one of the great American composers, John Cage, I, a quote from John Cage about my favorite piece of music is what we all hear when we let go of everything when we are quiet. So if you're patient enough, be the puto, the observer. So this stillness, John Cage's preference, favorite music is a silence. I thought, I really like that. Because he used silence in his, many of his compositions. And silence is what, conceptual proliferation obliterates. You can't find, you can't be silent if your mind's just going on and on in its proliferating habits. But you can be the observer of it until it ceases. And what, and in its ceasing is Silence. So when funerals, when we chant, Anicca vada sankhara ubhata vaya tamino ubhachita vani ruchanti de sangu basamo sukho. In Thailand, they chant this when anybody dies. Anicca vada sankhara, all conditions are impermanent. They rise and they pass away, and in their passing is peace. So we, in Lung Po Cha, used to talk about die before you die. Letting the personality die, let it live while it sustains itself, it'll cease. Thoughts arise and cease very quickly, they die all the time. So thinking is, is a, really a, a matter of, of believing in proliferating it with words, how one word connects to another word, to an emotion. Certain words will bring up fear, bring up happiness, bring up terror, When we talk about peace, just the word peace in 
when I was a layman, I did meditations on peace, and just by reciting the word peace, I'd feel peaceful. War is like this. They affect emotionally, you know, the power of words. But what is transcends emotion is awareness. Emotion arises and ceases in awareness and consciousness. And we learn from the way we are. So if you're a conceptual proliferating crazy person, you learn from that. See it as an opportunity to awaken to it and not get rid of it or try to resolve it or blame it on somebody else. Because those are all proliferating options. Blaming somebody else is about proliferating. Blaming it on God is proliferating. Blaming it on your past or just the desire to get rid of it. And listen to myself. You know, I, I don't like this, I want to get rid of it. I listen to myself thinking. I'm not afraid to think that. But it's intentional thinking. I don't want these thoughts in my mind. I don't like them. And by listening to myself thinking, I tune into John Cage's favorite music, Silence. Because underlying all the proliferating, the very substratum, the basis that all conceptual proliferation takes place in, is this silence, is reality itself. Peaceful. Silence is not about war. It's not just the word peace that arises and ceases, and as soon as somebody says another provocative word, you're upset. The peace, the very ground substratum of being here and now, is like this. So what's the next question? Well, the second question is about uh, pure consciousness as it is referred to as unconditioned. What does that mean? And if it is unconditioned, what happens, for example, when we fall asleep or fall into a coma? Well, if condition depends on, if uh, consciousness depends upon senses, if, a, if consciousness arises from senses, then it is impermanent, like sensory consciousness. You know, it's conscious. You're conscious through seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. If, you know, why would those, the, these organs, these sense organs, wouldn't work without consciousness? But when the eyes go blind and the hearing de, de, falls away, and your sense of smell and so forth, when the body dies, what dies is the, the senses pack up. They no longer function. They start decaying, disintegrating. That's what they're supposed to do. So, but does consciousness disintegrate? And to prove this, you know, before you go blind or deaf or die, you notice the little deaths, the ending of thoughts in awareness. 
and you realize the deathless reality of here and now, the silence that's, that's never separate, never absent, but we don't notice it because we're, we're caught up in our own thoughts and habits, emotional problems, worldly perceptions. Just like space is, is uh, here and now. The space in this temple is here and now. But how many of you really notice it, you know, really give it any value? It's a big space. It's a peaceful space. But space is not, does not about size or peace or war, because space accommodates anything, you know, the wars that take place, take place in the same space as we're sitting in right now. The space is not, not defined by my personal perceptions of the spaciousness of this temple. The temple's in space. Each one of us is in, these forms are in space. Spaces in consciousness, awareness. So consciousness doesn't die. When there's no when there's no senses, then there's it's, it's resting. Consciousness is at rest. It's not operative through senses, but it doesn't die. So in deep sleep, you know, it's a matter of when we like to sleep without dreams, we long for that, the rest. But you're not dead when you're in deep sleep. But if you think of consciousness as limited to eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, to the brain, and so forth, then that is, you know, that's the, the petty-minded limitations that one creates around the, the uh, just never investigating condition phenomena, not dying before you die. Death once dead, there's no more dying then. This is Shakespeare's, one of Shakespeare's sonnets. Death once dead, there's no more dying then. So meditation is letting things go their natural way to death, thoughts to death, emotions. Let them be what they are and then they cease. That's death. That's the end of a condition. And you're still alive when you're aware that anger, so you feel anger, and you open to that anger, you don't grasp it, you let go of it, it ceases. So you, you, you affirm the, the death of anger is like this. Die before you die. So meditation is about dying before the body dies. The deathless Dhamma doesn't die. Deathless, Amata, the word Amaravati, Amata, Amaro, they're all about deathless. But you can imagine deathless because images are conditions. But you can know deathlessness through awareness, through mindfulness.
So in the third and fourth noble truth, it's about dying. Trusting in the absence of attachment. Desires still arise and cease, but you, 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 the witness to desire, this realm that we experience through these forms is all about desire. What we see, hear, smell, taste, touch, think is about desire. This, the good, the bad, the beautiful, the ugly, heaven and hell, right and wrong, true and false, justice and injustice, fairness and unfairness. And it's about, we desire all the, the we want the, all the good things, and we don't want any of the bad things. But desire is something that is a condition, it's not ultimate reality. It's a sankara. So death once dead, there's no more dying then. And then if I quote this Vinyanangani Dasanang Anantang Sapado Prabang, this statement of the Buddha and the consciousness, Vinyanang, Ani Dasanang, in invisible, infinite. But then, in regards to sensory death, that, that's to be expected. That's what you're, you're, you're leaving behind your, these habitual attachments to death, bound conditions. Because your personality is all about death. And your, you know, these, this sense of me as a separate person in the universe the body being attached to the to the human form it's going to die no matter how what diets you live on how much medicines and how much plastic surgery you go through you still get old get sick and die it's like this this is not this is normal this is natural the way of all conditioned phenomena But why do we attach to it? You know, I ask myself, why do we attach to, to such conditions? Because we don't know any better. It's a vicha, it's ignorance. We've not learned anything else. But here at Amravati, this opportunity to be reminded of this is constant in our foremost, in our practice. So it is a you know it is a special occasion have a meeting like this to be reminded of the you know to be encouraged to be encouraged to to do this because we are you know a person as a personality we tend to feel discouraged by a lot of things, because we aren't getting what we want or what we expect. You're not getting the peace of mind you expected when you entered the Sangha. You begin to see things that you don't agree with or don't like about this form. Uh, monks, the nuns that you had great respect for in the beginning, you begin to see flaws in their character and their personalities. So, you know, when we come in full of expectation, full of faith, at last I found the right path, my teacher, my way, is, you know, this can be very inspiring at first, but inspiration is impermanent. 
So if you're someone in life depends on being continually inspired, you know, then point to that, that you, you, you want the inspiration, but not the desperation. You want the, the things to be beautiful and wonderful and good and loving all the time, and when they change, you're dis, dis depressed or disillusioned. But all this is, is self-view, you know, how we, what we believe, what we've been told to believe in, what the, our perceptions, conditioned perceptions of right and wrong, what should be, what shouldn't be, is like this. But the form, it's a traditional form, so it is a form. But its, it's whole point is to point toward the deathless reality of here and now. Not to attach to the form itself as, as our salvation, but to see that salvation or enlightenment doesn't have a form. And it's not something you lack, something that's missing, it's something you overlook. You don't see because of conceptual proliferating habits, of your fears and desires, your cultural conditioning. So I offer this as a reflection.